everybody, and welcome. This is Speaking of Everything, and I'm Melba Tolliver. The distance between Adelphi University in Garden City and the National Conservatory in Prague, Czechoslovakia is more than a matter of miles. It's also differences in culture. The way one Long Islander is going to bridge those differences and that distance is through the language of dance. It is a language in which she is very fluent. They're going to say, now do a pirouette inside on your right foot. Pas de deux, pirouette, jeté. The words roll easily okay, off her tongue. And, and as far back as Rochelle Zide Booth can remember, so can she has danced, the has the talked the dance, the and has taught the dance. The Television was the medium for this appearance on Camera 3 some 30 years ago. Well, when I started out in Ballet Russe, I spent half of my time as a swan and half of my time as a rather naughty can-can girl. What are your thoughts as you look at the young uh, Rochelle Zide? Well, uh, the first thing that strikes me is how high my voice was. Um, I noticed that too. <laughs> it was my, my, when my daughter saw it, she said, Mom, your voice, I said, it's going to happen to you too. Don't worry. For the past 16 years, an Adelphi University classroom has been Professor Zide Booth's stage. We get a lot of kids coming into Adelphi uh, that haven't had any training in ballet at all, or very little training, or training that needs to be retrained. It's not been good training. Um, so I'm used to working with older dancers. Teaching came naturally when an Achilles heel injury cut short a career that had had all the ups and downs of soap opera punctuated by prized principal roles with important companies, the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo, the Robert Joffrey included. Now, thanks to a Fulbright scholarship, she's off to Prague, Czechoslovakia to teach the American ballet system to Russian-trained exactly, um, teachers. This is a very good chance for America in general. Uh, and that's, I think that's one of the reasons why the American Embassy was so intent on having me come and do this. Because I've had experience in working in higher education, um, with curriculum development. I think that's one of the reasons why, rather than an, a normal quote-unquote ballet teacher who just goes in and teaches classes, I would be the right one to go and do uh, a curriculum redevelopment there. And also, I think that one of the things that played into the hands of the Fulbright people was that I have lived abroad. I spent two years living in the Netherlands, and I have spent long periods of time in the Philippines and in Israel and other countries, six, seven, eight weeks at a time. So they knew that I was going to be able to adapt to other cultures. Explain, uh, if you will, this curriculum redevelopment that you're going to be involved in. Let's say if you're, if you're going to school, uh, academic school, and you're going to take, you're taking uh, math, you know that by the end of the year, you, if you're taking algebra, you have to accomplish the beginning of algebra, the middle of algebra, the end of algebra. Um, th it's the same thing with dance. There are certain steps that you have to accomplish by the end of the year. There are certain levels that you have to reach by the end of the year. Maybe this year we're going to concentrate on turns. So we're going to learn all kinds of turns on one leg, on two legs, on the ground, in the air, turning inside, turning outside. That whole year may be a development of turns. Um, but there, what they're going to show at the end of the year, they're going to have an examination. And they're going to say, now do a pirouette inside on your right foot. We are going to take that pirouette inside on the right foot. We're going to put that in, in a combination with other things, jumps, um, adagio, all kinds of things, and it's going to become just another element in dance. The problem with the syllabus is no year is devoted to dance. There's no year in the syllabus that says dance. In any syllabus, you have a year that's, or a part of a year that's, developed, that's dedicated to jumps, or to turns, or to a certain position. We're going to work on attitudes, which is a position with one leg uh, bent, either in front or behind you, and with the arms in different positions. But none of that is dancing. And that's the problem that I found when I was there, is that no one was teaching dance. Over there, the syllabus is made for the ideal body. It is a Russian syllabus. Now, we in America will probably never produce a Baryshnikov or a Makarova because we are not willing to cripple dancers along the way. Now, explain that. Well, yeah, explain that. When you say that we will probably never produce a Baryshnikov because uh, in this country not willing to cripple dancers, what do you mean? Because the Russian syllabus is only ideal for the ideal body. For, and, and, and the ideal body is? Is a body that is very flexible, 
and where the joints are very flexible, and yet there is a certain muscular development and strength, usually genetically there, and then they just build on the genetics. And um, in America, when you walk into a class in America, if you walk into a ballet class, you're going to see a six foot three inch man staying next to a four foot nine inch woman. One will be chunky um, with very strong muscles. I mean, if you, if you go, if you look at, at our Olympics or our Pan Am games that are going on now, you can see the difference in body structure in America. What is an American body? We, we don't know it in America. We're all different. Um, but over there, they tend to have, in Russia or in Czechoslovakia or in Poland, they tend to have very much the same body type because they've been inbred for so many generations. Now, in Russia, they get 1,000 students applying to the school every year. They take 20. So you know, and they take them by body type, not by talent. They don't even determine the talent. So you and know the that they're taking... And same thing in they, Well, that's the problem. Therein lies the problem, because in Czechoslovakia, they don't get a 1,000 students audition. They get 100. And when you take a quarter of 100, it's not the same as taking 20 out of 1,000. So they don't have the greatest uh, selection of body type. And their system doesn't work on the less than ideal body. And the less than ideal body being forced to assume positions that that flexibility requires can literally become crippled. There are Russians who studied dance who have difficulty walking for the rest of their lives, in the way that our football players, with their injuries, have difficulty sometimes after football in, in, uh, in carrying on their normal lives. There are many, dancer, many people who were trained as dancers in Russia. They don't make it all the way through the school, because the idea is if you can't do it, get out. And over here, you see, we see the talent. Sometimes that talent isn't put in the right packaging nature or God or whatever did not put it in the right packaging. But that's not a reason why that, that, there's no reason why that talent shouldn't get a chance to perform. We feel in America. In Russia, you don't get a chance. In Czechoslovakia, you don't get a chance. You become a folk dancer or you do something, but you don't become a ballet dancer. So they don't know how to train dancers. They merely know how to put the syllabus in orbit. You can do the syllabus. And if you can do it, you do. And if you can't, you get out. And um, as a result of that, because they have to have numbers in their classes in Prague, um, the same as in colleges. I mean, if we can talk honestly here, we sometimes take people that may not be the most suited. And surprisingly enough, some of those people are the ones that turn out to be dancers in our system because we are willing to take into account the fact that talent can be developed in a different way. This is Speaking of Everything. We're talking to Rochelle Zide Booth about dance. We'll continue right after this. We're back. Speaking of Everything, talking about dance with Fulbright Scholar, Adelphi University professor Rochelle Zide Booth. What you've just uh, described seems to say something uh, about, uh, about the American culture and democracy where ideally people just get a chance. That's right. And that's, again, that's why I think it was important, it's important at this time, because Czechoslovakia is looking to the West. Actually, it isn't Czechoslovakia anymore. The Czech and Slovak Federated Republics um, are looking to the West now. They've been looking East. Uh, they had no choice, really, but to look east over all those years of Soviet occupation. The last Russian troops just left. I'm not even sure they're all gone now, but they, they've just left within the last year, occupying troops. So now they're looking to the west because they want, in dance, to become a, an international art. Would you uh, say something, Rochelle, about uh, uh, what has happened with black dancers? One of the reasons Arthur uh, Mitchell started the Dance Theater of Harlem, because people said blacks didn't have the right body type. I, yeah, and that's in America. I mean, well, we should know better. Um, the problem with blacks was that they didn't have access to good training. I, I was just, I, I, I teach at the Alvin Ailey American Dance Center. Just yesterday, I was looking into the door of the studio. The company was rehearsing um, Donald McHale's games, which is a masterpiece. And I was looking, I, I was just, the way the light was hitting the dancers, I couldn't see their faces. And that company has blacks as well as non-blacks. And I saw about f three or four young men dancing with gorgeous feet, the kind of feet that one would expect to see, the highly developed instep, that one would expect to see in a Russian dancer. 
as the, they finished with the rehearsal, they started filing out of the room, there were four black young men. Now, people said that blacks didn't have good feet. Um, there are certain, if you will call them, characteristics of uh, the African, the more pure African Americans, um, the tall Watusi types, generally with the long uh, legs and long slender muscles, but the feet are not very highly developed, not, not well arched. They're strong, but they're, they tend to be flat. Okay, but with training, we can do something about that. And we have done something about that. Now, that long musculature is the ideal in ballet. But we had to do something about the feet. And what we had to do was give it good training, give them good training. That's what's happening now. In this country, it would not happen in Russia because those feet would not have made it into the school. Mm -hmm. What is it that qualifies you to go to Czechoslovakia to do this work? Uh, and what do you hope that you'll be able to accomplish in just one semester? That's a difficult question. First of all, I, wa I was hoping to go for a year. They asked me for a year. But um, it's very difficult, uh, since I do teach at Adelphi, uh, it really puts my university in a problem if I'm not there. We have a small uh, faculty. So I'm only going for, si for the first six months. What, um, what I hope to accomplish is really more with the teachers than with the students. I can help those classes of students that I, I work with. I helped them in three days when I was there before. That's not the future of dance in, in Czechoslovakia. The future of dance lies with the pedagogues, with the teachers. So what I'm hoping to do is to open their minds to where they can understand that, that you don't have to look at the body, that you can start to train dancers, and they have to learn how to train. I hope to do that by example and by workshops in which we really sit down and discuss things and, um, and work out problems. Uh, what qualifies me, I think, I've been teaching. I had my first regular class of students when I was seven, six, because I won a prize at my dancing school, which was the Bar Work Prize. And it was adjudicated by a very famous dancer named Anton Dolan. He came to my little school in Boston and adjudicated all of the students in the advanced class. And he picked me of all of them and said, I did the best bar work, which means that that's where the training in dance is done. It's done at the bar. Um, not doing bar would, would be like going to trigonometry without having done algebra and geometry. I mean, you could do it, you could go, but it's going to be awfully hard. And you could, there'll be a lot of gaps in your education. So I did a very good bar work. And the prize for that was a book and that you got to teach the baby class um, the bar work. So and at six years old? At six. And they didn't you, want me to do taught? it. Yeah, they didn't want me to do it. My teacher said, well, we're going to give you the book. And this girl who came in second, who was about 15 or 16, she will teach. And I said, no, no, I want the prize. I want to teach. So I started then probably just by spouting what I had learned without much thinking about it. At, at six, what are you going to do? But I knew right then that I wanted to teach and that that was not going to be something that I fell back on or that happened to me when I could no longer dance, but that this was going to be an alternate career, and I didn't care when it happened. It was going to happen. And at six years old, well, you were pretty precocious uh, yourself as a dancer. You started dancing, was it at three years old? Seriously, yes. Two was, I wasn't sure. But at three, I told my mother I was going to be a ballerina, and that was it. I had no other, nothing else in life that I wanted to do. And um, to all those parents out there who say, oh, that's terrible, what if you hadn't been able to make it, et cetera, et cetera, all I can say is, I'm a grandmother, I'm married, I have three children. I mean, I had an, an absolutely normal life, although at the time, it probably didn't seem as though I was going to. But I think that having had that ambition and that drive and wanting to be, knowing what I wanted, and going full force, putting all my eggs in one basket, not taking Latin in school because I knew that French was the language of ballet and I needed to take French, not taking biology but taking music appreciation, and then an anatomy and physiology course later. All of those things were, were devoted to the ballet. But doing all that made me better fitted for the time when I couldn't dance anymore because that happened in three minutes. You know, at, at five minutes of 12 on one day I was a dancer and at noon I was not a dancer anymore because I had an accident. And so I just took all of that drive and ambition and put it into something else. All right, we're going to talk about that, uh, that, that accident that changed the course of your uh, career. But let's get back to three years old. How did your, your 
uh, career as a dancer develop after that? What uh, you grew up in Boston, mm -hmm. you studied in Boston, you mm -hmm. and then what happened? Well, I went to. I used to go to New York on my vacations from school. I mean, it was so inexpensive then; you could do that. And um, I had always wanted to be in the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo. I had seen that company. It was a touring company, and it had a repertory that I loved and the leading dancers that I loved. And um, when they opened a school in New York, the Ballet Russe finally opened a school in New York the year that I turned, uh, I was 15 that year. So I came into New York and went to the Ballet Russe school on my February vacation, and I came back in my April vacation, Easter vacation from school. And one of the days during that Easter vacation, in fact, it was my 16th birthday, um, the secretary of the school asked if my mother was there and could we go down to the office of the director of the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo, the company. And uh, I went down, and on the way down, I said to my mother, he's going to offer me a scholarship to this school, and if you don't let me take it, I'm going to run away from home. Because I wanted, that was my company. And I said, I'm not going to tell him that I, you know, I can't do this. So she knew I was serious, and when we got there, he offered me a job in the company. And my mother said, but she's just 16 years old. And I said, very practical, where did you hear about me? Speaking of everything, we will continue the conversation right after this. We are back with Speaking of Everything, talking about dance with Rochelle Zide Booth. So launched in, uh, and your dream realized at 16. Right. And I never auditioned. I've never auditioned for anything, which is probably lucky because I did not have a good body. I mean, I was small. Um, I was always very feminine. That's putting it mildly. Um, I was not heavy, <laughs> but I had a very you mean you womanly were developed, shape. You had I was a womanly developed. Body. I had a womanly shape, mm -hmm. and um, I did not have beautiful feet. I, all those things that we were just talking about, I didn't have all those things, but I could dance. So you can really identify with this uh, this circumstance that that you're talking about, uh, and and uh, and and the way things developed in uh, Czechoslovakia along the Russian line. You can personally identify with not having this ideal body. Right. And one of my problems, and it's a problem I'm going to have to really be careful about while I'm there, um, is that I tend to identify more with those who have the less than perfect body, um, and I shouldn't do that. I have two chill two of my children children are, were gifted and talented in school and in those days gifted and talented children were kind of left on their own you know the classes were always taught the school classes were taught for the children who were in the middle and then they would give my kids that they'd put them in, in a, a little special area and give them books and say okay and I have to be careful that I don't do that with talented students because I know they're going to make it you see I know they are the others need the extra help and I get very excited about those others if I see talent and if I see the will to work if they don't have the will to work forget it. If they have the will to work, even if I don't see the talent, I'll work with them because something's going to happen with those. So I have to keep myself open to the ones who are talented as well because they deserve a chance. I do it at, at Adelphi, I do it at Ailey, but I do tend to push the others knowing that somebody else is going to speak up for the ones that are very talented. Now I'm going to be the spokesperson for the one who, ones who aren't as talented, yeah, physically gifted. This is not going to be your first visit to Prague. Um, you were there, what was it, a year ago? It was, uh, yes, just a year ago, just in the summer. Ago. I was there in June. Um, I was teaching, invited to teach two weeks in Cologne for um, a workshop called Dance Black America. And um, I taught in Cologne for the two weeks, but before that I wanted to go to Prague since I had been with Netherlands Dance Theatre and had met Yuri Killian, who is now the director of Netherlands Dance Theatre, who was an emigre from, from Czechoslovakia, he left during Prague Spring in 62, was that 62 or 67, whenever that was. He left at that time and um, he couldn't go back and his parents were still there and he was very sad about not being able to go back. We wanted to go, so we uh, decided to go as tourists and when they heard I was going as a tourist, they asked me to teach some classes and I taught a week, five days. Given the political situation there, do you have any concern about uh, going back to that country? If I can learn to keep my mouth shut, no, I don't. Actually, it should be better than it was when we, I mean, we, we noticed there were groups of students in the, in the big squares, and, and the, um, they just had the, uh, 
uh, re revolt and repression before I came. There were um, new graves of, of uh, students that had been killed or dissenters that had been killed. Um, no, I'm not really not worried about it. it and it's probably naive uh, because I am an artist and I just feel as though when I get into the theater and into the school, th that just doesn't touch you somehow when you're there. I am going to be walking a lot, and that, that may touch me then. And I am very excited about it, and I am a very political person. I mean, I, I left this country for two years um, to move to Holland because of political reasons. Um, what were those reasons? Well, the second Nixon administration. I didn't want to bring my children up in this country. I had worked for McGovern, although I didn't feel he was going to be a good president. But um, I worked for him because I knew what Nixon was, and I didn't know what McGovern was. Um, and I didn't. My husband and I just decided we couldn't really live in this country at that time. Um, so I am a political person, and I am going to have to be careful mm -hmm. about what I say. Um, but I have my husband. My husband will be with me, and we can bounce off each other and 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 politicize with one another all we want to. And just be careful outside. What kind of preparation are you doing for this trip, uh, say, in terms of language, uh, knowing more about the culture? Say it in Czech. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I bought a Say It in Czech book, and I have um, the, uh, the man at the bagel store down the street here in Queens on Union, Turn on, uh, Union Turnpike is from Prague. And we meet with him. We see him every. In fact, we saw him this morning. And he's going to meet with us in the library. He gave us a film of uh, just a movie, a plain movie, for us to listen to the language. I am very good with languages. I taught myself to read and write and speak Russian. I've taught myself French. I've taught myself Hebrew. I've taught myself Dutch. I mean, a lot of languages. Just enough to get around and enough to get by in. And um, so, because of that, I can learn the vocabulary. And these films will help me with the pronunciation. And I have a Czech student at Ailey. And whenever I come in, we, you know, every day, she's in my class every day, and we say hello, we say goodbye, and I ask her some questions. Um, in terms of the culture, the, uh, the USIA sends a lot of information. Um, that's my packet. The first packet that I received, over half of that was information about the recent political situation and about the history of the country. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we were looking before we started this taping at uh, a tape of you, of the film actually from uh, Camera 3, done in 1960, 16. in the early 1960s. Right. When you look at this tape of uh, the young Rochelle Zide, wh what are your thoughts? What do you re recall or remember, or what, what, what happens when you see yourself at another age? I see, I recall the joy, and I still see the joy of the dancer in that. I think what I'm struck with is that I did dance basically the way I thought I did. I danced with a great deal of enthusiasm and a great deal of joy. What do you hope you'll be bringing back to Adelphi after this uh, time in uh, Prague, to the university and to your classes? That's an interesting question. Um, a freshness, I've been at Adelphi 15 years. So a freshness, a new way of looking at, at, at dance. I hope to bring back music. I'm going to be choreographing when I come back to Adelphi in the fall, in the, in the sp spring for the dance concerts at Adelphi. And uh, hopefully I will use some Czech music. I don't know at this moment whether that's going to happen, but uh, I will be looking for music over there. For this past half hour, we have been talking dance with Rochelle Zaid Booth of Adelphi University. I hope you've enjoyed the program and that I'll see you the same time, same place next week. of its politically difficult suggestions for groundwater protection will ever be adopted by local governments. Pat Dolan, News 12, Long Island. And Koppelman says that because of all the controversy surrounding the plan, it stands only a 1 in 10 chance of ever becoming law. Much more on the Evening Edition when we continue Brown of Hairlines back in bankruptcy court. And uh, I'll be telling you about a woman who's teaching new dance moves to students of the old school. The sustained extension of the legs and the control of the body.
Soviet system reaches into politics and economics and also into the teaching of dance in a former Soviet satellite. Well, now an Adelphi University dance scholar departing this month for Prague, Czechoslovakia, is bringing some American moves to their Russian-based tradition. I'm going to say, now do a pirouette inside on your right foot. Pas de deux, pirouette, jeté. The words roll easily off her tongue. And as far back as Rochelle Zaid Booth can remember, she has danced, has talked dance, and has taught dance. Television was the medium for this appearance on Camera 3 some 30 years ago. Well, when I started out in Ballet Russe, I spent half of my time as a swan and half of my time as a rather naughty can, -can girl. Well, uh, the first thing that strikes me is how high my voice was. Um, for the past 16 years, an Adelphi University classroom has been Professor Zaid Booth's stage. We get a lot of kids coming into Adelphi um, that haven't had any training in ballet at all or very little training, or training that needs to be retrained. It's not been good training. Um, so I'm used to working with older dancers. Teaching came naturally when an Achilles heel injury cut short a career that had had all the ups and downs of soap opera. Punctuated by prized principal roles with important companies, the ballet Russe de Monte Carlo, the Robert Joffrey included. Now, thanks to a Fulbright scholarship, She's off to Prague, Yugoslavia, to teach the American ballet system to Russian-trained exactly. teachers. Um, this is a very good chance for America in general. Uh, and that's, I think that's one of the reasons why the American Embassy was so intent on having me come and do this. Now, the semester that Professor Zaid Booth spends in Czechoslovakia will also have a payoff for the Adelphi University community, as well as for dance lovers on Long Island. I hope to bring back music. I'm going to be choreographing when I come back to Adelphi in the fall, in the, in the sp spring for the dance concerts at Adelphi. And uh, hopefully I will use some Czech music. Hmm. So as you heard, Professor Zaid Booth expects to return to Adelphi in the spring semester and gives all of us something to look forward to. Yeah, and I can, I can see students clamoring to get a seat uh, in one of her classes. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. She's terrific. Hey, Roberto. Right. Here we go. Got it.